I'm really excited. Uh, I know that this Sunday, something's going to happen that I don't always like. You know what it is? I am going to be deprived of my Sunday afternoon nap. It's going to happen. It's just a busy day, and busy days sometimes requires a little extra coffee. Oh, those little bitty chocolate-covered coffee beans, those are really, really great. Because I cherish going home, turning on a ball game that I am watching, even though my eyes are closed, and getting rest. Because rest is so beautiful, except when you can't have it. You long for it. And then it becomes such a bummer when it's deprived of you. Maybe circumstances prevent you. There's the burning the candle at both ends. Sometimes the, the worries and the anxieties of, of life, they get to you and they, they crash in on your rest. Sometimes uh, you suffer from insomnia. By the way, I am adamant. One day I'm going to be a part of the cure for insomnia. I will not rest until I do. And so it's just one of those things that we absolutely must pursue is rest. And the Bible is really sweet because it tells us that Jesus at times rested. Uh, and so we have that example. But it also encourages us to find our rest and hope in Jesus even when the world is crashing, even when the floor gives way, even when God's hand sometimes seems invisible, but it is still clasping on, we are called to rest. And today we're going to look at an example of it found in the Psalms, Psalm number three. We're going to be there, and I would encourage you to turn in your copy of the Scripture uh, together with us. If you're using one of our uh, pew Bibles, we're going to be on page 472. If you happen to not know where Psalm 3 is, I encourage you to turn there in that copy. And if you need a copy, you can take that one. It'd be our gift to you. Uh, we'd love to have God's Word in your hands. Um, and uh, it will also be on the screen behind me. But we're going to be looking at the Psalm of David. In fact, it's the very first psalm in the Psalms with that little subscript above it that tells us that this is a Psalm of David. Psalm 1 and 2 uh, are psalms that are more than likely attributed to David, but we're not really sure. Although Psalm 2 tells us, uh, and the New Testament tells us that David was a part of Psalm 2. But this is the first one that the Psalms itself proclaims it's a psalm of David, and you would think of all the things he would talk about, his need for rest, his anxiety, his difficulties, his suffering, his needing help in finding his rest in the Lord, and yet his confidence that that is exactly where he'd find it. it it's unique that that's the very first one in the catalog of the psalms, but yet it is so good for us. And so today I pray it will be a blessing to you and as you see it, it will give you more reasons to praise the Lord, to seek the Lord, to plead with Him on our behalf to say, God, help us rest in you and find our peace in you. Would you stand with me as we honor God in the reading of His Word? As I said, this is a Psalm of David, but it is the Word of the Lord. Psalm 3, verses 1 through 8, this is the Word of the Lord. Lord... How my foes increased. There are many who attack me. Many who say about me, there is no help for him in God. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory and the one who lifts my head. I cry aloud to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their side against me on taken their stand against me on every side. Rise up, Lord. Save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have been blessed with the gift and accessibility to your word, the revelation of who you are, what you are like, what you have said, what you have meant, and why we are to trust you, and above all, why all that transforms our lives as we see you made known to us. 
as we hear you speak to us. So God, I pray that you would help bring that treasure to us in our lives. God, we live in a time where rest is a struggle. We all have anxieties. There is a restlessness about us at times within our souls, at times within our homes, at times within our places of safety, sometimes in churches, sometimes in workplaces. God, we live in a place and a time in our nation where there is restlessness that abounds. Struggles on streets, struggles in neighborhoods, from rural lands to urban centers. God, there is restlessness. There are conversations that can't even be had in civil ways. There's harm that people put in befall others made in the image of you. And God, we pray that in a time that it seems so restless, God, would you remind us once again what it is to have our security in you? What it means that we can lie down and sleep and wake again knowing that you have never left us. You have never departed. You have not once forsaken. You have always been faithful. And God, remind us in our restlessness that you are not passive, but you are powerful. God, that in the days that we face, that we wonder about the difficulties, there is nothing that is too difficult for your hands. There is no enemy that will ever overthrow your throne. Remind us again that you are the Lord. You are indeed the Lion of Judah who fights in our battles. And you are the land that was slain that brings about our redemption. Lord, help us find our rest in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the beauty of rest, the bummer of restlessness, what does the Bible have to say about it? How does the Psalms, our time in the Psalms, lead us to to deal and wrestle with this sometimes anxiety-ridden question? Whenever we see what the Bible is telling us about God, well, when we come to what the Bible says about God, we need to understand it is what God is saying about God. And so if we want to know God, we must go to the Word and, and, and understand what God is saying and, and what God has meant. And we're going to look at this psalm that was written in a specific context and time. that will give you a little bit more idea about why it's so helpful for us today. You see, this is a psalm of David. And, and in that subscript, it says... A psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Now, some of you may know this story, some of you may not. But I want to give you the, the, the shorter, condensed version just to give a little context of this. It says David was fleeing from his son Absalom. There had become a rift in the relationship between father and son, between David and Absalom. And there's a lot of history that goes along with it. You can find this in 2 Samuel verses chapters 15 through 18 if you care to read that or re, re, uh, review that. But basically what had happened in the aftermath of David's fall into sin with, with Bathsheba, there were going to be difficulties. There were going to be consequences. The Lord displayed grace to David. The Lord did not strip away the kingdom from David. The Lord still had a plan for David. The Lord still was going to perpetuate David's throne ultimately to where we have Jesus. None of that failed because God is gracious. But it does not mean that God does not sometimes leave the consequences for our discipline, for our growth, for our stretching, for his purposes. And a part of that was that there was a rift in David's home. And you may think that every home has its distasteful activities. Uh, every home has its problems. But David's is one that is replete with, with news for us that lets us know, wow, how terrible a tragedy, but also how great is a God that would help even a family that broken be used for his purposes. You see, David had a son named Ammon. And Ammon had a half-sister named Tamar. And he looked upon her fondly in an infatuating way. And ultimately, that led to him bringing an abuse of sexual nature in the home to where he raped his sister. 
Now, Tamar was the younger sister of a brother named Absalom, who was also Ammon's half-brother. And so years went by, and no justice seemed to be done upon Ammon for what happened to his sister. And so Absalom plotted and planned and ultimately took the life of his brother, killed him. And it's an act of revenge. It's an act of, 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 of bringing what he thought was justice in the moment. And in that, he fled. And he fled far away because he thought, there's no way I could ever return to the kingdom. There's, I will always live in a- exile. Now, David, seeing the brokenness of his family, he, he, he saw that he longed for his son to return. He saw the wrong that had been done. But he felt the conflict. Crimes had been committed and not been addressed. But ultimately would bring his son back from exile, but did not really have a good place where he even talked to his son. He kept him at distance. He never had an audience with him. To the point that a festering uh, distrust, a festering rebellion rose up in Absalom's heart to the point that he says, I could be a better king than my father. In fact, I could be such a better king than my father. I will not wait for the Lord to take my father's role. I will take it from him. And so he stirred up a rebellion and ultimately not only gained uh, uh, enough people to, to cause a war within the house of Judah, but also brought along some of David's most trusted advisors at the time that sought to bring about his downfall. All of this is taking place to where David has to flee Jerusalem to go back into the wilderness. A man who has already fled once from another king whenever he was younger is now fleeing from his son. And yet he is pinning this honest, open psalm in this context so we may know it, so we can understand He still had confidence in the rest of God, though all the crashing burdens of his world surrounded him. And I say that to you today, and the Bible opens this up for us in context so that we can say, oh yeah, it was pretty easy for David to talk about rest. He's a king. He lives in a castle. What's his problems? But to bring you comfort and say, if the Lord is can be dependent in most, these most dire situations, then we have no reason on our own to say that God could not help us find our rest in our anxious times. This is what it means. And in that, I hope we will find the application, seeing the context that we'll see, yes, even God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who did for David what he did, it was also be gracious to us in our time of need. And see how this applies, ultimately finding our rest in Jesus. And today we see that we can indeed rest and trust in God, knowing that it is God who is the one that protects. It is God, the one who fights for us. It is God, the one who rescues and saves us. And today I, we need to know this. One, because we know this already, but the Bible makes it clear it's not telling us something contradictory. Rest will be, is And we'll always find difficulty because the rest will be contested. Rest will always be put to the test. It'll always be put to the extremes. Here David is making his plea. And he says, this is how rest is contested in my life. And we can see even implications of this in our own life. He says, my rest is contested because my foes increase. Instead of my friends increasing in number, instead of everything starting to get, you know, more peaceful and, and, and easier as I go, I find in my life there are even more foes than I once believed. He says, he's pleading the Lord saying, my foes are increased, Lord. And, and not only the foes that they just have slight against me, they have poor distaste for me. These are foes that attack me. <coughs> Get my water over here just a second. These are foes that attack me, and they attack me in multiplied. That's beautiful. I'm glad. So, yes, that's so nice. The attacks are, are multiplied. It says there are many who attack me. I, I don't only have these foes that are increasing, but they're, they're actually out for my harm. 
They're actually looking for ways to devastate me. He, he's not talking figuratively. He is actually fleeing from an army of people. And he says, there are many that have hurtful words against me. That, that, that they, they say, there's no help for you. That they're, they're talking about me, but they're talking about it in a negative light. There's, that there's no help for you. David has recognized, we'll talk about this next week when we look at Psalm 51. David has recognized he's not perfect. He's not sinless. He has utterly uh, rebelled against the Lord at times. And he doesn't uh, pretend or presume that he is holier than thou or better than others. But he's saying, these people have said, there's not even a hope for you. You've already committed far too many wrongs, and there's no need for you to even look to God for help. Rest is contested when our foes are increased, when our attacks are multiplied, when words are hurtful, and ultimately they even say, there's not even anything God can do for you. There's no help for you in God. And you may say, wow, David really had it coming against him. But we can see glimpses of this in our own life. Heck, we can see glimpses of this even to ourselves. Sometimes we make ourselves the worst foe against ourselves. Sometimes we, there are attacks that are coming from the outside, and they are multiplied. Sometimes the words that are said about us are hurtful. But one of the most despicable places that a person can be, as Spurgeon said, Sometimes we face the trials of heaven. Sometimes we face the temptations of hell. And sometimes we face the crosses of earth. But the most desperate place a person can be is when they believe there is no help for them in God. Well, the most awful place, when someone says it against us, when we believe it for ourselves, both result in God being mocked. Both of us result in, in rest being contested. Both of them are, well, comes to the, the, the conclusion that ultimately God doesn't protect me. Ultimately God doesn't fight for me. God doesn't save me. But yet the Bible is saying the truth that we need to rest in is that the Lord doth protect. We must not forget the Lord shepherds his people. We must not forget that the Lord fights that he is, as Psalm 18 says, a warrior coming on the clouds. Exodus, when they were going through the Red Sea, that was the claim. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And the Lord not only protects, he not only fights, but he wins. He prevails. He saves. Rest will be contested, but we must not come to the place where we accept that there is no help from us in God. In fact, our direction must be to confess that you are our only help. David's plea to the Lord was, Lord, you see this. Lord, you know my foes. Lord, you see how they're increased. Lord, you see the attacks. Lord, you hear their words. You hear them say that there is no help for me. But Lord, this is my confession, not merely my complaint. My confession, not merely my complaint. The Lord must be our confession. Verses 3 through 4, David says, But you, Lord, are a shield around me. You're my glory. You're the one who lifts my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me. David professes these powerful, amazing praises that were true for him because they are true, period. Not because it's true for him, what's true for him, and what's true for us is true for us. No, it's true, period. That the Lord to his people is a surrounding shield. Not a flimsy toy, not a piece of plastic, not something cardboard that we've covered in aluminum foil, but a shield that surrounds us. A shield that is made for our protection. The Lord is confessed here as the giver of glory. David is saying something that is so rightly true that we must remember. We have no honor like the honor that comes from the Lord. And if we have no honor that comes from the Lord, we have no honor. We have no honor like that which comes from the Lord. And if we have no honor from the Lord, we have no honor. David says, that you're my glory, and, and you're the one that lifts my head. Like, when I am downcast, when I am trodden, when my shoulders shrug, when I feel beaten and burdened, when I'm carrying the baggage of the pilgrim on the pilgrim's way, 
We look up to him and see what he did on the cross. That's why Hebrews tells us that we're to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he despised the cross and scorned its shame. It was for the joy that was set before him, and that lifts our head. The Lord is also the one that we can cry aloud to. And, and make no mistake, David is not just having this quiet contemplative prayer, and there's nothing wrong with quiet contemplative prayer, but the Bible has an expectation that the words and the mouths that, that the Lord gave you, you'll put into use calling to him at times. Because he's the one that hears those words. And whether they be mild or loud, the Lord hears them. He is our plea hearer. And not only is the plea hearer, but he is our plea answer. The Bible says that the Lord must be our confession because he answers from his holy mountain, from the place of his resting, the place of his dominion, the place of his throne, the place where his holiness is made known. The Lord answers the prayers of his people. And when we can come to the Lord, even though the trials be many, even though the foes be increased, even though the attacks be multiplied, even though the mocking of God be heard, even though the, the doubts of self that there is no help for us may be pushed. When we come to this place, say, you're my surrounding shield, you're my honor, you're my head lifter, you're my prayer hearer, you're my prayer answer. Lord, that means you're the one who protects me. That means you're the one who fights for me, and I can trust in you even in difficult days, and I know that you, the Lord, will save Thirdly, not only the Lord must be our confession, the words that we say, what we publicly declare. That's why we talk about public profession and praise of God. But the Lord must be our sincere inner confidence. So this was not just mere words that David would pen and, and proclaim so that others would hear him. This was something that was very personal for David. It was something that was evident personally in David. And it's something that should be evident and personal in us as disciples today like David. Here's what David says. After saying this is all these things about praise, look at how this personally applies. It shows his confidence. I lie down and sleep. I wake again for the Lord because the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their stand against me on every side. Now remember the context of this psalm. David is not writing the context of this psalm about whenever he was in his palace with a nice cedar furniture and the nice pillows and the drapes and the blankets. David is saying, in the middle of the war camp, when I have had to flee in the middle of the night to cross a, a, a body of water because someone may attack me in the night, in the middle of the place where I know there are now armies that are actually in pursuit of me, I lie down and sleep. And I wake because the Lord sustains me. This is not the, oh, it's just kind of easy, now lay me down to sleep. This is that I sleep and I wake again because it was the Lord's hand of grace in the moment. The Lord for David was his confidence for sustainment. If I live, I live for the Lord. If I die, I die in the Lord. But nevertheless, my peace rests in the Lord and I indeed am able to sleep because of him. The Lord is the confidence for our strength. He says, I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their stand against me on every side. Man, I love reading those words. They sound like very macho manly words, right? Yeah! But I'll be the first to admit, I'm a wuss when someone says, hey, can we have a conversation? I, I need to talk to you about something. I feel such, do you feel the weight of that? How cowardly we are that, that I won't have the strength to have a meeting with one person, to have a conversation with one person because it might be too difficult, how stressful. And yet, here's David saying, the thousands are against me. I'm not going to be afraid. Why? Because the Lord is my strength. And his way, his hand will prevail. 
And he says this because it is his confidence, not merely his confession. He says this because the Lord is the confidence for salvation. The Lord saves. That's why his plea is in the next verse, as we'll get to, rise up, Lord, and Lord, save me, my God. You see, in this confidence is more than just wordplay, more than just making appearances and saying, hey, just trust the Lord. He's our shield. Just trust the Lord. He hears our prayers. Just trust the Lord. He'll lift your head. Just trust the Lord. He's your glory. All of that is true. It, just because you said it does not mean it's bad. It just means, is it sincere? The words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart. And for David, you see in this moment, in a moment of utter crisis, when rest is contested, the Lord is his confession. The Lord is his confidence. Because he understands in the Lord, I have someone who protects me. He shepherds. In the Lord, I have someone who fights for me. He is strong and mighty. We do not worship a God who is puny. And we have a Lord who saves. His hand is never too short to reach. His arm is never too weak to uphold. The Lord saves. And then lastly, his prayer is the Lord is our only completion. If we're going to find this bringing completeness, more than just a prayer, more than just a time of peace and sleep, but the completion for our lives where our souls are actually settled, reconciled with God. There's a few things we must recognize about the Lord. That ultimately he is the final authority. He has the final say. That everything comes down to whether we are with him or whether we are against him. And then this is the prayer that he prays. Rise up, Lord. Save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. And so his completion is this. God, I know that in your day and in your time, according to your purposes, you will rise and everything will be made whole. Everything will be made right. Every wrong that we've ever faced, every trial we've ever undertook, every adversity we've ever faced, every temptation that has ever battled against us, every hateful remark that has ever mocked me or you, every, every aspect of our life, God, one day you will rise and you will reconcile. And salvation will be evident. He says the Lord is our completion because he rises up. The Lord does not keep distant. The Lord does not keep quiet. The Lord does not say, you know what? You're never going to see my face again. No, one day the Lord will rise up and we will all stand before the Lord. And those that are his, everything that we've ever faced will be seen as worthy of praise to the Lord. Because he brought us through. Because he prevailed, because he protected, because he fought for us, because he saved us in the midst of it. All of it will testify to the one who rises up on our behalf. That's why we can certainly with confidence and confession cry out, save me my God because he is the one, the only one we can plead to and ask and he will do it. That's why Paul writes with confidence that the one who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved because there is no other name under heaven by which men shall be saved and he is the one who hears the pleas of his people. When he, we say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, he has mercy. When we ask him to rise up and save, he saves. And one day he will have that ultimate stand. That in a world of brokenness, in a world of harm, in a world of pain, in a world of anxieties, in a world of restlessness, there will be ultimate rest. Why? Not because we've achieved utopia. Not because we finally were good for goodness sake. Not because we finally built the perfect plan and everything is at peace. But because he rose up and made all things new. The Lord is our completion because he rises up. The Lord is our completion for his saving of his people and his people are all who have called upon him and saved him. 
It is not because you belong to a certain tribe of people. It is not because you went to or grew up in a certain nation. It's not because you had a certain denomination that you attended whenever you were going to church. It's not because of anything that, that makes you his people. It's because you, seeing your sin in need of a Savior, called upon the Lord saying, Save me, my God. And he saved you, and you are his, and he is yours. That is the only way, I hope that you understand this, that is the only way that you belong to his and become a person who is a child of God is by making your plea to him and making that known. But to all who does, he saves. But I want you to understand this difference. For those that call to him, he rises up and saves, and to those who will not plead the name of the Lord. You remain in verse, the end of verse 7. That the enemies of God, one day those that are enemies of God, God will not be passive towards. God will not just give a, a, a flimsy excuse about. No, the enemy's cheek will be struck. The teeth of the wicked will be broke. One day God's ultimate justice, when he rises up, it will be evident. And the question will be, do you belong to the Lord, those he has redeemed? Or do you remain an enemy of God? And David is pleading here. David is certain here that in the Lord there is completion that one day even the enemies of God they will not prevail. They will not. That God will be the ultimate bringer of justice. But he makes this statement at the very end. Salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. David makes this statement at the end, not just a pleasant way to wrap things up, not just as a nice way to say in Jesus' name, amen, but to make the testimony very quite clear in his own prayer, in his own praise. My salvation and the salvation of others is dependent on no one else but the Lord. It's found in no one else but the Lord. It belongs to him because it is the Lord who protects. It is the Lord who fights. It is the Lord who saves. And so his clarity here is not salvation is owed to me because I'm your king. Salvation is owed to me because I've been your shepherd hero. Salvation is deserving to me because I help prepare all these things to build a temple. Salvation is not given to me because I write really nice songs that are kept in this book for ages and ages. Salvation is not owed to me because I have one kid that will ultimately build your temple. Salvation is not owed to me because that Goliath guy, I struck him down. Salvation is not owed to me because I was the last kid out of eight and you really love that family. And that's not why salvation is brought to David nor is salvation brought to us salvation belongs to the Lord and it is all of grace the New Testament makes this clear that to all who received him the Lord Jesus he gave them the right because he is the only one who can give the right to be called children of God to those who believed in his name. For this was not the will of man, nor the will of the flesh, but it was the will of God. And so David is very adamant, I am not praying this prayer because I am deserving of it. I am praying this prayer in spite of it because the salvation that is given is all of grace. And then his prayer is, may that blessing, may that blessing that is above every blessing be on your people because only that will bring the reconciliation and rest that the world truly needs may this be a lesson to us as we learn from david as we learn from the word of the lord that we see that our ultimate rest is found in the lord god jesus christ who protects his people who fights for his people who saves his people who sustains may he be our confidence and confession and ultimately, 
may it be that he's our completion. Let's pray.